Good morning. Man, I want to give a sincere thanks to Dan and the worship team and all of you for joining in with him. Uh, basically, together we've sung the sermon today. So I'm going to ask you all to stand for the closing benediction. I was watching to see if someone would jump up really quick and try to take advantage of that. But boy, what a beautiful time of worship. Pointing us where we need to be pointed. You know, we've been in a series, God Is, and we've been going through looking at who He is because what we truly believe about Him is the most important thing about us as we do life. God is a holy God. He is a holy God. He can never do anything wrong, and yet we know we're not holy, and that leaves us in a predicament, and yet God is a God of love, a God that loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be restored. A God who is sovereign, who is in control, that no matter what's going on in our world, nothing can change who he is. Nothing can change his plan and his purposes. He is sovereign. He is a truth teller, as we saw last week. He's going to always tell us the truth. And as he leaves us on this earth to navigate through life, we have that foundation of who he is, that he is truth. And his revealed truth, though the flower fades, his word will remain true and endure forever. And that brings us to today. Man, if we believe those things about God, then what that does, it presents to us an incredible gift. God is peace, his gift to you. God is peace. I want to look at what it means to be at peace with him. We know life can be hard, and I wonder what is it that makes your blood pressure rise? What causes you to lose sleep? What are the things that make you angry or make you feel insecure? Sometimes our lack of sense of peace is due to past trauma. Or maybe for you it's just the financial struggles that, that you're facing or unresolved family con conflicts, maybe within your marriage, maybe with your children, maybe it's the political landscape, maybe it's the threat of war, maybe it's all the sadness, all the hurts that get funneled through the media into our hearts and minds, maybe it's your job, maybe that's been a really tough environment, maybe it's your own failures and the shame that comes with that, maybe it's illness, maybe it's pain. How much pain can I endure for how long? Maybe it's navigating grief, the loss of someone or something very special to you. Maybe it struggles with addictions. Maybe it's just life is so hectic, you just feel like you're being buried under a pile of stuff, and it's just way too much. Life can be hard. And as we dig into God's word today, I want you to keep in mind, what is that storm in your life that you're facing now? What, what is that leading peace buster that you're having to deal with? And I, I want you to, to think as we go through God's truth, I want you to apply it personally to you, to whatever that is in your life? What's keeping you from enjoying, experiencing the God of peace? How do we find peace? <laughs> How do we find peace? You know, in the 60s, the hippies, there was a whole lot of this going on, peace. <laughs> and there was a lot of mention of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it attracted large crowds and had a huge impact on culture, but as those of us that lived through it, 
or have read about it, it failed to bring peace. If, if you're here today and you're looking for peace in, in this stress-filled, uncertain world, here's where you must begin. Uh, Hebrews 13.20 says, How now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. He's defined here, God is defined as the God of peace. He is absolutely our must-go-to source if we hope to find peace, a peace that's not controlled by our outward circumstances, by the world around us, by things that we can't control We see the God of peace bringing order to all things at the very beginning of his narrative, the Bible. And and we read that first verse, that first sentence, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and and God confronted a dark formless void and, and he brought about order by speaking creation into existence. And and he stood back and it was really good what he created and the man and the woman that he created, it was good. But just a couple chapters into the Genesis narrative, we see Adam and Eve rebel against God, and we see peace displaced by turmoil and chaos, and God's creation is disrupted, and and his at-peace relationship with Adam and Eve is disrupted too, and they are found hiding in the garden, hiding from God instead of welcoming him, covering themselves with with fig leaves, feeling shame, feeling guilt, feeling fear, things they never felt before. The peace was gone. This is the primary problem for all of us when we think about our lives and we think about peace. The writer, as we read in Hebrews 13, 20, points us to the God of peace, then he is the source of peace, he is the maker of peace, and only he can fix our broken relationship with him. Only the God who is peace can bring us peace peace. That's where it has to begin. To experience peace with God, we're totally dependent on his initiative of reconciliation through Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, jumping in at verse 19, it says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And so we see God's fullness lived in Christ. Jesus was 100% deity and, and all of us have chosen to reject him. And Romans 3, 10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 5, 10 says that we are actually enemies of Christ. And Colossians 1, 21, as we'll read in a little while, it says that, that we have the same problem Adam and Eve had as they hid in the garden. We are alienated from God. Our hearts and minds are hostile Toward him, we are completely broken. We are unable. We have no shot at fixing ourselves. Only God, through Jesus, could reconcile us. How does it say? By means of Christ's blood on the cross. He shed his blood. He paid the penalty for our sins. And this is the only way our relationship with God can be restored. It's the only way we can be at peace with him, and it's the only way that we can experience peace in our lives. 
And it's not about God changing to accommodate us. Rather, he changes us. He gives us new hearts. He renews our minds. He gives us a new standing. He declares us holy, declares us righteous based on what he has done, based on what Jesus has done. A restored relationship, a reconciliation, a healing that takes place because of Jesus and Jesus alone. I think we've all experienced the joy of a restored relationship and how exhilarating that is. I, I met my wife Diane and, and we became friends and we dated for about four years and before we got married and, and we had a lot of good times during that four years. But both of us remember very well twice in that course of four years that we were in situations where we thought it was over. <laughs> and I can't remember what the issues were, but I remember the feeling <laughs> I remember being a boat on Lake, in a boat on Lake Strauss, and we both wanted out of that boat. <laughs> and it was a terrible feeling, but I also remember, as we worked through whatever those issues were, what that felt like in the exhilaration <laughs> of knowing that love was there, and we were going to continue with that relationship. This is even bigger when you think about our broken relationship with the living God and, and, and that we're no longer enemies. In John 15, 15, Jesus referred to, to us as his friends. <laughs> Moving on in Colossians 1, verse 21 now, this includes <laughs> you who were once far away from God you were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. We were separated from him. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. <laughs> and you are holy. You are holy. <laughs> and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. <laughs> That's how God views us, not based on what we can do or accomplish, but based on what he has done to make it possible for us to be reconciled with him, brought into a relationship with him. This is where peace has to begin. Romans 5.12, we read that we've inherited Adam's sinful nature. We're born into this world spiritually dead, and along with Adam and Eve, shame and guilt and alienation is something that we have to deal with. But now, it says we're brought into his presence, again, without a single fault. Seriously, <laughs> I mean, if we get this, we got to realize we don't have a stinking chance apart from Jesus. To be declared without fault, without a single fault, <laughs> impossible for us. It is the grace of God, it is the love of God that makes it possible and we've got to be careful that we're not striving to try to feel like we're good enough to be in a right relationship with God because we never can get to that point. It's through Jesus that we are reconciled, that we are brought back into relationship with, that we can be at peace with him 100% based on what he has done. Romans 5, 1, therefore... Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God, peace with God, because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us by faith in Jesus, in his provision, in his shed blood. We can be at peace with God. We can be fully restored 
We no longer, folks, we no longer have to cower in the garden with Adam and Eve feeling guilt and shame. Do you want that? Do you want that? (laughs) One way, faith in what Jesus has done. And it changes everything. Second part here, God is peace. Be still. And this section is about how can we claim this gift of peace? God is peace. How can we receive that in a way that it not only saves us, but it impacts how we do life, that it settles our hearts and our minds no matter what's going on in this world, our worlds. Our biggest fear-causing problem has been solved, and, and God wants our understanding of being at peace with him to impact how we navigate the storms that we face in life. And so, so God is constantly orchestrating my life, your life, to accomplish that goal. He's growing us in our understanding of who he is and who we are. He's orchestrating our lives so we can get to the point where we will apply faith to our storm and we will find peace in the midst of that storm. And so a great account of Jesus, the teacher, teaching his disciples, Mark chapter 4, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. And then I, just one thing to note from these two verses, please note that, that Jesus clearly made his will known. I, let's get in the boat and go to the other side of this lake. And, and the disciples, who were probably exhausted at the end of another long day, faithfully obeyed him. They faithfully obeyed him. God spoke his will. The disciples said, so be it. Verse 37, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it became, began to fill with water. Severe storms common on the Sea of Galilee, the lay of the land, the hills on either side and, and, and some smaller valleys and the funnel of air and storms could be fierce and often on that sea. And, and imagine being... The disciples in that boat, crowded in that boat, imagine the noise, imagine the wind. Was it dark by then? Could they see anything? They could certainly feel the high waves crashing repeatedly over the boat. They could feel the water rising up, their feet, their ankles, and up their legs. This boat is about to sink. They were in real danger. (laughs) Does that seem fair to you? (laughs) God made a request, they obeyed his request, and it led them right into a life or death situation that was incredibly fearful. Is that, f- is that fair? <laughs> that I could obey God and my obedience could lead me right into a storm? <laughs> God is at work. He is always at work. He is always orchestrating our lives. He's wanting to shape us, grow us. Verse 38, God was sleep, where Jesus was sleeping, who is God, 100%, at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? And I wonder, do storms, I I think I know the answer to this, storms sometimes leave us wondering, does God really see me? (laughs) Does God really care about me? Does he have any interest or understanding of what I'm going through? And the reality is that that he does, but his highest priority is doing whatever it takes to, to mature us, to grow our faith. You know, we can have the tendency to, 
to want God to be like a genie in a bottle that we just rub the bottle, we make the request and we say, say, God, this is what I want you to do and I want you to do it now. And yet if we view God that way, then we are going to often be disappointed and we will become disillusioned because life won't always happen and God's plan for us won't always be what maybe we would say we would prefer. We must let God be God. Whatever we go through, even the really hard stuff that God leads us into, allows us to go through, we need to know that he's at work and he's accomplishing his will both in us and through us. And, and it's so important as we go through storms to remember and, and to acknowledge God I want your will to be done. Above everything else, I want you to accomplish your will in me, through me. And secondly, above all else, God, I want to honor and bring glory to you. And God, I would love if this storm went away. (laughs) But in the midst of this storm, I want you to accomplish your will in and through it. And I want to represent you well by honoring you, bringing glory to you as I go through this storm. Jesus slept soundly because he knew that he was doing his father's will. It was all part of his father's plan. And secondly, he was bringing honor and glory to him. And we see over and over, Jesus did the hard thing, even to the point of going to the cross in order to do the will of his father, in order to bring honor and glory to him. So he had an incredible peace. And when he felt disruption, he would talk to his father about it and he would find peace and always do what was bringing glory to his father what accomplished his will jesus slept soundly for those reasons verse 39 when jesus woke up he rebuked the wind and said to the waves silence be still muzzle yourself and suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm Now, this is the God of peace bringing peace to a boat full of disciples. And I'm sure they were immediately thankful for that. But right after dealing with the storm, Jesus focuses on a more critical problem, and that was the disciples' fear, their reaction to the storm, the disciples' unbelief. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus asked them, calms the storm, asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And and what's he saying? He's he's saying to them, what's it going to take? What is it going to take? With authority, I have taught you the very truth of God, my Father. I have validated who I am by performing miracles. You've seen me raise people from the the dead. You've seen me heal people. You've seen me cast out demons. What is it going to take? Everything's good, and then a storm comes along, and then you act like you really don't know me. You, you just don't trust me. My, my presence being in the boat with you had no impact on your behavior. And not only that, you even questioned after all this time together, if I even care about you. I want to ask you a question. And I've encouraged you to think about 
your present storm and what you're going through and people around you that you love a lot and what they're going through. Are you able to see Jesus in the boat with you right now? And are you able to trust him during this storm? How have you been navigating the crashing waves one after another? How have you been navigating the rising water and the potential consequences of that rising water? Jesus says, see who I am. Please see who I am. And we can see they're starting to get it. They're terrified. They're thinking, could this be God? I mean, he's doing things that the God of what we call our Old Testament, only the living God did those sorts of things, controlled nature. Could he be? And they're terrified at the thought. They're still not getting it. Jesus says, see who I am. See me present in the boat with you. And for us, it's not just in the boat with us. He indwells us. He lives within us. We are his temple. Know that I care. I want you to receive these words. This is a gift that every one of us would Look forward to opening under the Christmas tree. Jesus says this, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Jesus says, I'm leaving a gift. Peace of mind and heart. All of our obsessive, ridiculous attempts to find peace in our lives are a fail. The world cannot give us that peace. That peace begins and ends with the living God. And that gift is received by faith, believing in him. I'm going to just talk about some practical ways to open God's gift of peace. And uh, the first one is develop your relationship with Jesus. We're about knowing, living, sharing the heart of Jesus. And it kind of went by fast in an announcement today, but boy, are we a church that shares the heart of Jesus. (laughs) It's just incredible how everything we do and then... Sweet Katie gets up and just shares how we can be involved in taking something that's called a a Christmas craft show and turn it into a chance to share the heart of Jesus. That's, That's absolutely beautiful. But the knowing part of Jesus, knowing the heart of Jesus, we need to take what we know to be true and we need to be working on developing a relationship with Jesus that we need to make that personal and, and the more personal my relationship with Jesus becomes, the more quickly I see him in the boat with me <laughs> and know that I can trust him. Don't let it be just something you know in your head. Secondly, study God's word, know his promises. So much of our fears, our, our angst are built on lies and Satan is the father of lie. We need to know God's truth and apply that truth to the lies, taking every lie captive, anything that is in opposition to God's truth. Three, exhale. Exhale from time to time. Exhale a lot. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. We need to create space and see where we can see and hear God. Uh, Practical step number four, place your specific 
peace buster at the foot of the cross. And, and uh, you know, we just recently had a study in Philippians. And, and we're not supposed to worry about anything. We're supposed to pray about everything. We're supposed to bring those things to God. And then what is the result? That the peace of God comes upon us, a peace that the world cannot understand. Bring whatever that storm is to the foot of the cross. And in your sermon guide, there's some other great verses uh, I'm not going to take time to refer to now. Number six, own and confess your sins. You know, if we want to experience the peace of God, the gift that Jesus has given us, then we cannot ignore sin in our lives. We just can't. That sin will absolutely keep us from enjoying the peace of God. And again, there's some great verses there. I'll just refer to Psalm 32. David, a man after God's heart who sinned greatly, in, in those first five verses, he just expresses that it was like torture, <laughs> When he lived with that sin and kept it buried and didn't confess it, it about destroyed him. And then when he confessed that sin, it brought healing and restoration in his life. We cannot play with sin. We cannot uh, conduct ourselves uh, with patterns of sin in our lives and expect to know the peace of God uh, number seven, do life in community. Be vulnerable within that body of Christ in that group of believers. Hebrews 10, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together because we need each other, especially as the day of Christ's return draws closer and the world gets crazier. We need each other and, and uh, you know, choose faith. <laughs> in Jesus over the storms and fears that Satan wants to dominate your life with. And then there's a, another important step that ties so much into us understanding that God is peace and us receiving that peace. And, and it's an important next step. God is peace. Be his ambassador. And, and the entire narrative of the Bible is, is one of reconciliation from beginning to end. We ran away from God, and God loved us. He pursued us. 2 Corinthians 5, jumping in at verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. There's that gift again, that gift that Jesus gives us. He leaves with us. And, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. <laughs> and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Reconciliation, a gift from God. It's entirely a work of God. I hope you see that. And, and it is the primary mission of the church. It's our primary mission. Your, if you're a follower of Jesus, your primary mission, one of being an ambassador bringing reconciliation, bringing peace into your world, our world. And so he sends us on a mission, verse 20. So we are Christ ambassadors. That's what we are. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, come back to God. So now... Our role, as we receive the peace of God, as we live that out in our everyday lives, to then take that reconciliation, that peace, to be ambassadors of that peace to our world. Our words and actions throughout the week, at work, at home, in our neighborhood, our words and actions should shout to the world, you can be right with God, <laughs> come back to him. You can be right with God, come back to him. And I want to say that those words to every person here today, because not all of us, I'm sure, are right with God. You can be right with God, come back to him, come back to him. This being ambassadors 
of reconciliation requires stepping into messy situations sometimes. And, and the goal is to see hostility and strife replaced by peace and reconciliation. The goal is to see hatred and division being replaced with love and unity. I ask you a tough question here. What would the people you interacted with this week say about the impact of your presence? (laughs) Think about your week. (laughs) Think about the people you dealt with. Think about the tough times. Think about the rascals. Think about your own home environment. How would the people that interacted with you this past week evaluate the impact of your presence was was our conduct and attitudes conducive to God making his appeal for peace and reconciliation through us? Very quickly, just some steps to being God's ambassadors, practical things, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, we've got to be crying out, God, I confess my sin, fill me with your spirit, control me. Only then can we produce the fruit of reconciliation, the fruit of peace. We can't do it on our own. Be, secondly, be intentional as you step into the room. Be intentional about saying, well, this environment, I, I want to bring God's peace. I want to bring calm into this space. Thirdly, offer to pray with people you meet. Uh, I love how God's been doing that through so many of us. And recently I've heard some beautiful stories. Just offer to pray for people. Bring God's presence and peace into their lives, even people you've never met before. Number four, be willing to sacrifice and get messy as God directs. And uh, number five, respond uh, instead of react. And, and when we react, our reactions come out of broken places and we often behave badly. When we respond, this, this is us seeking intentionally to represent God and his truth and to honor him with that response. Respond, don't react. Every now and then we have to pause <laughs> And we need to step back because we realize my next word is going to be a reaction. (laughs) And so I just need to take a little time to get that under control so I can represent Jesus well. And the last one is smile. Every chance you get, smile. Every chance you get. (laughs) I, I just love as I'm going through a store or walking on a street, especially if there's tension in our world, where there's just people pitted against people. And man, if I see someone who I think, they probably don't like me and they probably hate me. Man, I I just love to give a gracious, warm smile to them. And often not a word spoken as we pass, but when they smile back at me, that fills me with joy. We need to bring (laughs) smiles and peace and reconciliation into our world. Romans 10, 15. I'm going to ask the worship team to start heading up there now. Uh, Romans 10, 15. It says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I want us to be a church, a church family that's made up of people who have beautiful feet. Do you have beautiful feet? Show me your feet. No. <laughs> Beautiful for, are the feet of those humble servants and children of God, people that he calls his friends as we walk into spaces and we bring that peace. Those are beautiful people. Those are beautiful feet. There's a peace in the presence of Jesus. Let's bring his name, let's bring his presence into all the spaces that we inhabit. Please, if you're here today and you have any question about whether you have been reconciled with the living God through Jesus, please don't leave here without settling that. Seek out a godly man or woman who can point you to Jesus or come front and will come around you No, embrace the peace of God. And we're all going through different storms. 
please take God's truth. No, he's in the boat. (laughs) Exercise faith in who he is and what he's declared to be true, please. (laughs) I want to end with two short passages as a benediction today. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. And together we say, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.